Hello and welcome to the Borough Breakdown podcast, an opposition preview show with Tom and Johnny and our guest for the evening, Graham from What The Folk, who is here to give us a Sunderland perspective on Monday night's game at the Riverside. Graham, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You could have had anyone and you chose me. I don't know why, but thanks very much. (laughs) Well, before we start, I just want to know how you're all feeling about the game in three words. Johnny, I'm going to come to you first because I feel like this is kind of revenge for all the times you've done it to me. Yeah. I don't know what I do now because I want like (laughs) shoes near a foot in it. Um, I want to say a dangerous Sunderland. I'm really nervous about this game now. Um, I know we were speaking, uh, Graham, a bit earlier and uh, I, I've predicted a Borough win, but I still feel really nervous. You know, Morbra has a fantastic record, doesn't he? And, you know, Sunderland fans have been united by Alex Neal leaving and they, had, they were really good last night as well. So um, a dangerous Sunderland is going to be my three words. I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> a bit nervous. <laughs> Graham, how about you? Um, calm and collected. I'm... Um, Best thing about this season is we've, we've had four seasons of absolute pressure in League One, just get out at all costs, you know, no matter what happens. And now we're in the championship. I mean, I know some people predicted us to go up to the playoffs and stuff like that. I think maybe it's unambitious, but most Sunderland fans are happy for a boring season, like 11th to 15th. But um, we've started really well. Um, so there's no like desire to be like, oh God, we're losing all these games. Like, We've won three and seven, I think. We've drew a couple elsewhere. We've only lost two, and they were against Norwich and Sheffield United, which you'd sort of expect. People would probably expect us to get beat at Middlesbrough, which is, as Johnny said, probably dangerous in itself. We're in form. Nothing to lose if we get beat. We're quite confident in the team. and um, It's weird to think. I'm sure we'll get into it, but the whole Alex Neal situation hasn't actually derailed the fan base at all. Um, we just plow on and get on with it. We're, we're quite calm and collected at the minute. I think so that sits, uh, suits it perfectly for a three-word review. Yeah, so I mean, just coming on to the uh, the Alex Neal situation, just want to address the elephant in the room before uh, before we kind of kick things off in terms of form and stuff. Obviously, a lot of drama within the last week. Uh, Neil out, Tony more brain. What's your thoughts on the whole ordeal? I'm probably slightly different to a lot of Sunderland fans, um, and and I've had a fair amount of stick for it, which is unusual because most people tend to think I'm relatively balanced, but. Um, I'm, I'm slowly changing in my opinion on it. But originally when it happened, it was, well, I'm a bit worried here because he's been, he was saying for a while, you know, four or five players I need in and I've been knocking down the, the door and there's no door left and all this kind of stuff. And I thought he's he's sending warning signs here. Obviously, he's on a, a rolling contract. Um, and But it all came across really, really fast. I, I was down Stoke. We won one nil. He's clapping the fans. I, I loved Alex Neal. Like, I know a lot of Sunderland fans are singing FM and all this. And for, I, I get the sentiment. And I'm quite pleased we're united behind the fan, the, behind the club and not kind of like bickering between each other. But um, my my thought process was, and a, a, lot, a lot of people said, well, you can't see he wasn't back. We've signed Ahmad Diallo. We've signed a, a youngster from PSG. Like, it's all a bit mad, really. But I think in Alex Neal's mind, he wasn't backed because he wanted experienced players that are going to win games and you know the games against um Coventry and QPR we were the better team both times and we conceded late because we didn't really have the legs um our starting 11 is is good enough for this level surprisingly good to be honest I think um could could do a job in the high reaches of it dare I say that um from the evidence so far but you could tell we needed the legs and we needed someone a bit experienced. We were linked to like Sir James McCarthy, who I know is like permo injured, but um, those sort of names are sort of experienced and, and someone that can maybe put the ball in the middle. So I think in Alex Neal's mind, he, he wasn't backed um, in that sense, whereas some fans think, well, you know, you kind of came for the project. You knew what it was. And I've got to be honest, as much as I was kind of more on Alex Neal's side at the time, I found it more and more difficult to argue with that. Why did he take the contract knowing that our process is developing young players. Our process is um, buying players under the age of 24 with like a smattering of like Danny Bart, Corey Evans, um, players that are over 30. Personally, at the time, and maybe a week ago, I would have said, maybe just trust the manager because he's the first manager we've had in four years. That's been excellent. Um, tactically, he's brilliant. Um, I love his character and his attitude. Um, but the more and more I think about it, the more I think, you know what, maybe... You knew the project you've came in and I know you want them to trust you a bit more, but for you to jump straight away to Stoke. And no offence to Stoke, but Stoke. 
Yeah, it's, it's stalk in it. It's not. It's not. Mm. It's like not. Uh, there's a video going around where it says, "Why has he gone to stalk for?" It's like it's like horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> e- excellent content. I mean, I, I've been to stalk for an out and stuff like that. And don't get me wrong, I'm not going to like tarnish any city or any place. But I think um, I found it a strange move. I went to stalk the week beforehand and. I was expecting a bit of an atmosphere. Stoke was very loud in the Premier League days. You've seen teams like Arsenal yeah. absolutely crapping themselves. It was dead. There was nobody there. Nobody cared. And I even said to a guy when I came out, I went, what's happened to you lot? Because I'm buzzing with one. I was like, what happened to you lot? You were rubbish. And he went, no one cares anymore, mate. It's just apathetic. And I was like, all right. And and I think he'll do a job annoyingly. But um, Tony Mowbray on the Saturday um, made me want to kind of jump out of a window, that name. And then the more I spoke to people, the more I was like, so you all sort of rate him. And they're like, yeah, like he does this, he does that, he does the other. And you know what? I kind of like the way he spoke. He's he's a proper borough bloke. Um, and I think I was saying to Johnny on my podcast, I think Sunderland people in Middlesbrough people are probably closer in attitude than Sunderland people in Newcastle people are, which the media likes to tell us we're both exactly the same. We're not. I think we're a lot more aligned with with Middlesbrough um, and our attitudes towards um, life, I think, in many ways. And I think Tony Mowbray will, will fit that quite well. He's he spoke well. He's he's been quite honest. Um, I don't know how much he had to do with yesterday because he even said himself that was the coaches that brought it in. But did a great job with Blackburn. Johnny on my podcast said he did a good job with Bora, and no one's actually said to me, mm, "Tony Mowbray." It's just not a sexy name. But do we need a sexy name at the moment? Not really. Jack Ross was a really sexy name. Lee Johnson, not a sexy man, but a sexy name, I guess, at the time because he had all of his buzzwords. Uh, buzzwords. And they didn't work. Um, Alex Neal was not a sexy name when we brought him in and he did a great job. Um, so, yeah, you know what? It, it's it's weirdly worked out in a really good way with the situation. I thought when Alex Neal gone, it was like, oh, God, here we go again with Allardyce. And I don't need to tell you what happened when Allardyce went. And it was even worse because he'd gone to Stoke and you were like, oh, God, here we go. But last night and on Saturday, as a fan base, we're really united. I mean, I know we're singing... F Alex Neal, but I think F Alex Neal is less F Alex Neal, it's more we are Sunderland. You're not going to do us no matter what. We've had enough of this four years in League One and people laughing at us on Netflix. We're back and we're going to make sure you know it. And that's when Sunderland are really dangerous. I would join in on the F Alex Neal chants just for my <laughs> hatred of the Norwich game and um, at the playoff final. I mean, yes, I do rate Alex Neal as a manager, but what he's done, I think collectively, that would be quite a nice chant on on a, on on Monday at the Riverside. So, I mean, by all means, please please do that. That'd be quite nice. Um, I think we will. I think, but I think with what you were saying there around like calm and collected and, and how things are in the United Sunderland and how things are, are potentially looking. How would you you? How do you think the season's going so far? Because you have started off bright. You know, there's you know three wins uh, so far. I mean, the defeats to Sheffield United and, and uh, Norwich were, you know, I, I think expected. But overall, how do you think the, the season's going? Are you you're relatively quite happy? Oh, you're yeah, really happy. Um, I'm I'm absolutely buzzing with it. Um, and to think how buzzing I could be with it, it's it's weird. Like going back to the 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 League One season's really really draining on you. Like I mean. Mm. It's rubbish. And I know that's like really horrible to say and it sounds so downtrodden because there'll be parts of the league when I look back on in a romantic way in 10 years' time. We'll remember Rochdale away. Oof. Um, no, it, it wasn't good. Um, and every game was pressure, so you couldn't win that. Um, the championship's a bit, bit better and, and the fan base is really realistic. Um, I think the media were pushing a lot of, oh, Sunderland this and Sunderland that and Sunderland think they're this. And we don't. We really don't. We, we, we know where we're at. We know what the plan is. We know where we want to be at. And I think we've overachieved. I think, you know, the, I came out of the QBR game. Now, bear in mind, QBR were 2 0 up, 87th minute. They got a great free kick, their first shot on target in the whole game. Then the goalkeeper scores it, like basically a salmon like header. You'd be absolutely beeling most of the time. You'd want to like rip the chairs out and fling it. Um, and that came out really philosophical and was like, we played really well there. You can just see we need more legs in the middle, but transfer windows not shut. So fingers crossed, you know, we'll, we'll be all right. And, and Coventry was pretty similar if not as dramatic as an end and as the QBR game was and you know the other games we've won away at Rotherham we've won away at uh, Bristol City yeah we've got deficiencies but um to me it looks like I would have been happy with 15th I would have been happy with a decent amount of points winning a couple of home games and maybe getting a couple of draws away from home and the best thing is we've looked at we can compete in every game just sometimes our legs run out a little bit but we're a young team um 
that that's going to happen. And we've brought in more legs, so hopefully there'll be more options off the bench. And hopefully these young boys that come in, yeah, I'm talking about sexy names, you know, Mishu from PSG sounds like a really sexy name. Ahmad Diallo is incredibly sexy from uh, Man United and, and former Rangers. But, you know, if these players are actually good at football, which I'm hoping they are, and I think, you know, the, the, there's reason to believe they will be, then there's extra numbers off the bench. And if we're coping well enough to stay in the division, what looks like comfortably, with a team that probably needs additions, and we've just added another four that had to come in the squad. As long as they're half decent, they don't have to be brilliant. They just need to add to the squad for us to be more than comfortable. If we're fifteenth at the end of the season, plough on next season. Um, Sunderland's a massive club in this division, whether people like to admit that or not. We're an attractive club. Um, we've been laughed at for a few years, but I think people are starting to look at our model and look at the way we play and, and look at the players that we've got and the fan base that we've got and go I fancy a bit of that. And that's kind of the. That's the next step, I think, isn't it, on the ladder to bring in players that are going to take us to that point where we're maybe comfortably mid-table and then potentially pushing the playoffs. No one's in any rush to get back to the, uh, the Premier League. It's probably soon if we went if we went up this year. It'd be far too soon. Um, but there's a project there and a, and a plan, and I have my doubts more than most fans in that project and plan, but I'm I'm wrong so far. Um, so, you know, carry on being wrong. I'm quite happy with that. Well, just carrying on on that note, um, you mentioned the the project. But how would you rate Sunderland's summer transfer business so far? Um, it's weird because like people might see it as defeatist. I want a bit more experience in. Um, I think we Phil Smith from the Sunderland Echoes just tweeted that that's pretty much just done by the looks of it, which is surprising. I think we expected maybe another two or three in a day, and we brought in three yesterday and announced them like before the match, after the match, during the match. It was a bit weird. They were coming out like pups. Um, but yeah, not bad actually. Um, I think we've been really unlucky in the sense that Dan Ballard, who looked really good, um, you could tell he was former Arsenal and played 31 games in the championship last year. He's broke his foot, that that's a real shame. Um, weirdly, Luke O'Neill, who I think we all thought would struggle in midfield, let alone center half, has popped in the center half, no bother. And typical Luke O'Neill just keeps coming back and just keeps proving people wrong, um, which is great. Ellis Sims has looked a real handful. Um, even if his first touch needs a bit of work, I mean, he's a handful. Um, the Jack Clark that's come in this year, he was good towards the end of last season, um, particularly impressive in the playoff games, starting and coming off the bench towards the back end of the season. He's been one of our best players. Um, he, he's confident. And I think when a winger's confident, we all know what a good winger can do. And there's a reason that Spurs paid £10 million for him. Um, and you're starting to see it. I'd like a few more experienced heads in. If, if it was up to me in an ideal world, I would have gone with a mix of the model and what Alex Neal evidently wanted, but that's never going to be the case. Um, the model is going to stick to the model no matter which manager we've got in there so that if a manager does leave, we can bring in somebody else and, and the plan stays the same and the cohesion's the same. Um, I'm not complaining too much. I'm, I'm really excited by Diallo. Obviously, I live up in um, Glasgow, so I watched him quite a lot for Rangers last year and incredibly raw, but... Um, I've seen some horrendous left backs and right backs in the championship already, and I quite fancy him to tell them a new one. And Jack Clark on the other side, yeah, bring it on. Why not? Yeah, well, it's interesting to hear you, hear you speak so fondly of the of someone at the moment because I think after years of I know like, say <laughs> despair, you know, like, like the relegations, everything that's gone on with the ownership and stuff like that. And I kind of just want to ask you this question: It's quite it could be a very philosophical question for you, but what does success look like for someone this year? Because You've had these years in League One. You've had the relegations. You've had just a whirlwind of probably of drama. I mean, it could be a. a I mean, I said it could be a television show. It is a television show, not in Netflix. But what what does success look like for for Sunderland this year? It's weird because it just shows you how mad of a football club Sunderland is that most of us would say boring, standard eleventh. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Um, I think the pressure's been so high and it's been so draining in League One and, and prior to those seasons, it was a horrible relegation from the Championship, which was I would never, ever want to live through that ever again. For some reason, they put it on Netflix and that was great. So I have to watch it when I just want to watch a TV series and remember that it existed. Um, and before that, you know, with, with hints of the Gus Poirier era going to Wembley, great, Allardyce coming in and really looking like he was going to take us on to the next step. But in reality, it was 10 years of struggle um, and going through managers like now else, like De Canio or Poirier, um, Dick Advocar, uh, you name it, the managers that were there, Roy Keane going back quite far. So it's been a long time of like 
been kicked square in the nuts, if I'm quite honest with you, um, for a long, long time. And I have a lot of doubts about a lot of things at Sunderland um, higher up. And, and I think some people don't. But I suppose it does feel good. Like, the fan base feels good. The fan base is like... When, when that second goal went in at Wembley um, and Ross Stewart scored, I think everyone's seen the scenes. Some of the best scenes I've ever been involved in. And I've seen you know England women win the Euros this year in, in flesh. I've been England getting to beat Denmark a couple of years ago. I've, I've seen Sunderland win a championship. I've seen Sunderland beat Chelsea 4-1. I've never felt a feeling like when Ross Stewart scored. Because, um, yes, unbridled joy, but Sunderland don't succeed. Like that's mm. kind of in our makeup, where like the glorious losers almost that everyone sort of respects because we're always there, like complete idiots. But when that goal went in, things changed for someone. Um, it was kind of like, oh, hang on a minute. We thought, you know, Ross Stewart might score and we might win at Wembley. That's what we were praying for. And we've just battered this Wickham team that in every Sunderland story would beat us at Wembley. And I mean, the Charlton game when we got beat 1-0 at Wembley, it was the lowest I've ever felt on a football pitch, uh, on a football ground, sorry. I felt like everything, it just came out my gut. And the flip side of that was the the Ross Stewart goal. And I think that day at Wembley, that weekend at Wembley, even with Alex Neal going and all that rubbish that's gone with it, has really just put something back. It's it's kind of like something's been stuck for ages and someone's just gone, bang, punched it. And it's gone, oh, there we go. We're on the way again. That's mm-hmm. fine. Like we're, that, that period's over. Um, and I think it's been even more accentuated by the fact that Alex Neal has gone, which is an absolute disaster. Like I could have cried when I heard that news. I want to be sick. It was awful. Um, and yet here we are less than a week later and I'm talking like this. Something's changed at Sunderland. Something's kicked into gear somewhere. And even with all my doubts about ownership and doubts about recruitment, I, I can't even deny it. Um, and I think that's why we'd be quite happy having a safe, comfortable season. Just like for once to be like, you know, that we believe in this kind of project and we are finished 11th. That's progress that. Well, brilliant. Are we making progress? Are we doing good things? Okay, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on board with this. Um, so for me, success is like just comfortable. I, I don't think I, I'd like to win the league. That would be amazing. I'd like to go to the playoffs. That would be tremendous. But it doesn't really fit with a model that we've got of steady progress. So because that would be up and down straight away. And then, then where do you go? Um, I like this kind of small segments of happiness. It's quite nice. Mm, quite nice um, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah it, it gives you expectation. It gives you realism and it, and it makes you feel quite good occasionally. So for me, like 11th to 15th, and I think a lot of Sunderland fans, I'd never speak for every Sunderland fan, but I think a lot of Sunderland fans might agree with that. Well, looking ahead to Monday night, um, how is it that Sunderland's set up at the moment and who should we be looking out for as the, uh, the danger man? Uh, well, Ross Stewart is the best striker that ever existed. Um, so <laughs> definitely him. <laughs> we, we, I mean, we, we, we wanted him as well. We think he's great. So get your hands I, off I'll him. take that. <laughs> nah, nah. Income, income was, mate. Income was. It's fine. Don't think you'd like it's it. Um, <laughs> We're after a strike, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've seen that, actually. I, I heard you needed quite a few. But, um, but Ross Stewart, you know, on a serious note, is like, he he epitomizes that feeling that I've just said about before. Mm. Look, I've seen Kevin Phillips, I've seen Al Quinn, I've seen, dare I say, Darren Bent, um, when he signs, as I say that. Um, and I've also seen Jermaine Defoe. I've seen some great strikers at Sunderland, even Michael Bridges. Um, and do I think Ross Stewart is as good as them? I, 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 certainly not Phillips, and, and he's got to do a lot more um, to get to that level. But I do love him. He doesn't have any flaws. He's very um, fast. He can, he can travel. He's strong. His builder plays great. His work great. He's pressing. Like I'm genuinely concerned that if he keeps on this trajectory, that Premier League teams are going to go 10, 10 million. Should we? Should we? Should we try it? And that that's just testament to him. He's three hundred and fifty thousand from Ross County, and and that's where he's at. So definitely Ross Stewart. The way we're setting up is it's kind of weird because we we it looks sometimes like a four, but it's not. We actually feel the back three, but with no natural centre half apart from Danny Bott. Um at the minute it's you've got like Lyndon Gooch plays like a right wing back role, which he's he's not a right wing back, but he, he, he it's his best position. That that's the best he's ever played for us in my opinion for a long, long time. On the left hand side you've got Jack Clark who defensively I don't know whether he's that good, but him picking the ball up that deep takes us about twenty yards of the pitch and he's massively in form. He was outstanding yesterday. Um it feels like weekly I'm saying about Jack Clark, oh that was his best game in the red and white shirt. And a week later, I'm like, no, that was his best game in the red and white shirt. 
he's just confident, so he's going to be a danger. Um, in the midfield, Corey Evans is a total unsung hero. You'd sometimes he got absolutely pillared last year by me as well. Um, I think one of the guys on my podcast said he was the worst captain he's ever seen in the history of captains. Um, and he meant it as well. And then a week later, he scored against Oxford and had the best end of the season ever, which was just fantastic for him. Um, Corey Evans is good, though. He's really vital. I think if you take Corey Evans out of the team, then it becomes it becomes a, a bit lopsided. And that's where I want to see a bit of experience come in. But if, if I had to pinpoint people, we, we play in like this back three with um, like two wing backs and players in midfield and Pritchard in the 10 with a front two. So it's kind of like a 3-5-2 as we would class it back in the olden days. It's probably a bit different and there's probably special names for it and all that kind of stuff. But to me, it's a 3-5-2. Um, but Stewart's on form. Um, he's an outstanding player and I love him dearly um, so, so much. Um, Jack Clark's bang on form and Dennis Serkin has been terrific. He's another player that I've given a lot of grief to and I really didn't fancy him last year at all. Um, he's bulked up a bit this year and he's we signed him as a left-back from Spurs and Spurs fans were a bit disappointed. Um, I'm saying a bit, they were, they were really disappointed. And he was like, I were only left-back last year and there was a point when I was like, oh, not, not not for me. And Alex Neal turned him into a left-sided centre-back on a three. Um, and I was like, absolutely not. But he did really well in the playoffs and he started the season even better. Um if it wasn't for Jack Clark and, and Ross Stewart and the way they were playing, I would say Dennis Serkin's been our best player of the season. So those those three, I would say, but cohesively as a team, we're playing very well. You said a lot of love, but where's the where's the doubt in your mind? Uh, where where do you think this game's going to be won and lost from a from a Sunderland perspective? I I would be concerned if you score early doors. Um, I don't know why, because um, like every game this season, I mean. Coventry was 1-1. We scored first. Um, to be fair, Bristol Rovers scored... Uh, no, we scored first against Brist Bristol Rovers. That completely different division. I've got League One on the mind. Um, Bristol City, they scored first. And we pulled it back eventually twice to win 3-2. Um, the QBR game, they pulled it back. There's, there's not been many games where we've conceded first. And I'm not 100% sure how I would react to that. Um, and I know Borough are like 20th. I don't think Borough is going to be 20th. Um, you look through the squad, there's a lot of good championship players there, and Monday's a real test. I think the beauty of it is, unless we get hammered like 75 nil, if we get Nick 1 nil or we get Nick 2 1, if you'd said we'd lose the first, if you said we'd lose three out of the first eight games, and that would be Sheffield United, Norwich, and Borough, fair enough. Like, um, I know people say it's Derby and stuff like that, but like getting beat off Borough annoys me for the night. Getting beat off Redden annoys me for the night. Getting beat off Newcastle annoys me for a long, long time. Centuries, <laughs> years. Um, so I think you can take it on the chin. But our experience, you've got a really good manager. Um, you do a win. Um, but at the same time, like I said before, calm and collected. I'm, I'm going in there with no expectation, but quiet confidence. I mean, you've got confidence. Want to put your neck out and make a prediction for Monday's game? I'm not going to say we're going to win. I'm not that confident. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I said to, to Johnny on my podcast because um, I'm old enough to remember this. You you guys might not be, and some of the listeners might not be. But there was once a time in 1999 um, when the Spice Girls reigned supreme, and we played <laughs> Middlesbrough at the Riverside, and it was around the time um, when Sunderland just got promoted. We had Phillips and Quinn and all that kind of stuff. And to be honest. We went down to 10 men, early doors. Steve Ball got sent off, I think, for headbutting someone. I think it was Hamilton Ricard, actually, so he probably deserved it. Um, and he got sent off, so it was back to the wall. Um, we, we did really, really well. Managed to defend and conceded really late to Hamilton Ricard, which was a fantastic strike, if memory serves me right. And we scored five minutes later by missing a penalty and then a young boy who never did anything ever again, tapping in the rebound. I fancy quite similar to that. As much as I said I'm worried about you scoring first, there's part of me that thinks you'll have the majority of the game. I unfortunately think we might sit back, which I don't think is the right idea to do. I think we should just get at you. Confidence is going to be fragile. You've won one and seven. But I do fancy Borough take the lead, but then us to peg you back late and used to concede late again, which you've done a few times. Um, that seems to be where you're susceptible. So maybe Tony Mowbray will be like, just kind of wait to hit them. And then if we score, go at you. You become fragile. The, the, the crowd becomes anxious and we get a 1-1 draw and say thank you very much. Really long-winded way of saying that, that, wasn't it? Sorry. <laughs> that, that 1999 game, Sunderland had... Correct me if I'm wrong here, this, this could be way off, but it was Navy kit, wasn't it? The collar. Yeah. Yellow band. Yeah, yeah. And I said Steve Gold, by the way. It was, actually, it. it was actually Chris Megan that got sent off. 
because I was specifically mm. remembering telling the referee to f off as he left, and I was like, "Don't get sent off again. Don't like accentuate <laughs> the ban here." Like, um, I remember Steve Ward got his head split. That was right. I've got a weird memory for stuff. I watched that in a a beam back at the stadium. Were like, um, good scenes when we realised to be fair, but that was a particularly good time for Sunderland. And I, I, that, that, that's a good thing, I suppose. I said I'm worried if you score first because it hasn't happened much. But do I have confidence that we get it back? Just to repeat everything I kind of said beforehand, I think the fans would, and I think if your fans believe, the team tends to believe. Um, and I certainly don't think they give up if you scored early. So I, I quite fancy a 1 1. Your confidence is probably a wee bit fragile. The win for you is a lot more important than the win for us. We're going there without much pressure, but we are playing a good team. So it points to a draw, I think, doesn't it? Johnny, got a prediction? Um, uh, yeah, well, I said on, on Graham's, I'm going to go 2 0. Uh, I'm, I, we have to win. We have to win. I know Marlborough has a fantastic record against us um, as opposition manager, but we have to win. Um, I feel like. Giles versus Clark on that left-hand side is going to be intriguing because they're both really attacking. Um, and we'll see how each other, you know, if, if Giles go forward, how does Clark react? How does, you know, if Clark goes forward, how does Giles react? So it'll be very intriguing. I'd be, I'd be interested to see that. Um, but I think the game is going to be dominated on the wings for sure, especially with both of us playing a three. Um, but I'm going to go 2-0 for me, 2-0. And I think personally for me, I'm probably going to go with 2-1. Um, my confidence is a bit damaged at the moment and I just don't see us keeping a clean sheet ever. But there's so many things kind of going against us in this game. You know, Mowbray's record and the, the fact that we won 1-7 mm-hmm. in seven, where you're just thinking it's probably written and it would be typical Borough for us to win this one. So, yeah, I'd probably go with 2-1 myself. We could, but, just one, we could just one one it and just all share a palm. Or, I've got a few minutes yeah. for her. Just one yeah. one it, share a palm. Or, it'll be fine. We'll all be friends again. It'll be all right. We both hate Newcastle, so we've got things in common. We've hate Newcastle and hate Alex Neil. So, I mean, what what derby? <laughs> are we are we the same club? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. But anyway, that's it, guys. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much for joining me. Uh, this has been the opposition show from the Borough Breakdown. And this was all your Borough versus Sunderland. Is it a derby? Is it not a derby? Chatter in a pod.